notes is done. I I'll provide you with the PDF and you can read the PDF. Okay. Okay. Hmm. So, um, basically, see, I wait. I'll show you. I started with biological classification, and in that, I've given a little <clears throat> introductory part of that particular thing. Let me just share my screen with you. Okay, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now see, basically in this particular chapter, do you understand the meaning of classification in general? Yes, ma'am. Tell me, what is it? It's like to differentiate. Hmm. To differentiate, to segregate them, right? To put anything, anything into groups, right? That is classification. Okay. The same thing is done when it's done for organisms, whether it is plants, whether it is animals or microorganisms. When the same thing is done, we'll call it biological classification. Okay. Now, <clears throat> see, biological classification, it actually comes under a big study, just like how we have uh, botany and zoology under biology, isn't it? Yes, sir. Hmm. Same way, taxonomy is that bigger branch. Okay, so taxonomy is the branch of science that deals with the identification. See, for like in order to actually understand or, you know, put anything into group, first we have to identify something, right? We have to know what that particular thing is, isn't it? So that part is the identification part. Now, when we know the thing, now we can put it into a certain group. Like, for example, if you're looking at a plant and if you're looking at an animal, first you identify that, okay, there is a difference in between these two things. One is moving. One is not moving. One can, uh, you know, make sounds. The other cannot make sound. So you can put them. Now you will put them into certain groups. Like you'll put the plant into the group of the plant and animal into the group of animal. So that is classification. Okay. And when you're done classifying the organisms, meaning when you're done putting them into groups, then what you will do? You will name them. Okay. Or it can come, you know, this This is not the exact sequence, but we name them also, isn't it? We name the yes. organism. So all of these practices, the identification, the classification, the nomenclature, all of these comes under the big branch of study that is known as taxonomy. Clear? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Now, see, initially, there were many people that actually tried to classify in their own way because, you know, no one had ever done this before. So there were people that, you know, were actually trying to do this on their own. And with that came the three different types of classification. Okay. We'll all, we can call them as the types of classification or we can call them as the systems of classification. It's the same thing. Okay. So there are actually three systems of classification. First is artificial system. Then there is natural system of classification. And lastly, there is phylogenetic system of classification. Okay. Now, see, this artificial system of classification, it was given by Aristotle. This is the name of a person. So Aristotle in the 350 BC. Imagine how long back. Okay, so in that point of time, what he did is that he actually classified the organisms as plants and animals. Okay, and he said that his study, like his basis of differentiating them was morphological features. See, morphological features means the external features, meaning the things that are visibly from the like visible from the outside. Okay, morphology. Okay, so that is external features or external appearance. So he said that okay, I will differentiate organisms depending upon how they appear externally. So he put like he put forward two groups. First was animals, and then there was plants. Which is clearly very distinguishable, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, what he did that what he did was 
uh, he classified animals further into depending upon uh, whether the red blood cells are present in them or not so he said that okay those organisms that have the rbc that is the red blood cell will be known as in ima en and those without the rbc will be known as an ima okay so he classified organisms depending upon the rbc this is not very practical okay it's not at all useful but still it is the first study that was ever done now amongst the plants he classified them depending upon their size okay he said okay the ones that look really tall i'll call them as trees the ones that look shorter than the trees i'll call them as shrubs and the ones are, that are really tiny i'll call them as herbs so he classified plants depending upon their size now size is something that you can see externally isn't it yes sir so in the artificial system of classification aristotle actually classified organisms depending upon the morphological features any doubts up till now no ma'am you're getting what i'm trying to say yes sir um but which animals don't have rbc like example there is no organism so like in, in terms of higher animals there is no animal that does not have but when you look at lower organisms like worms insects they don't have rbc oh okay We, you yeah. will study about this in depth when you will study animal kingdom there is another chapter that is related to all of these things only okay okay so this much you uh, uh, this uh, artificial system of classification you have understood yes ma'am okay now the second type of classification was the natural system of classification okay now a little more advancement came and people thought a little more so this natural system of classification it was given by bentham and hooker two people in like from the year 1862 to 1883 now see these are all the characters that they took into consideration just like how aristotle just went with morphological character the external appearance but in this case see morphology they also took external appearance into consideration after that they took anatomy see anatomy means internal structure the structure of the cell the way the cell is all of that would come under anatomy okay so okay. morphology and anatomy then cytological characters see the word cyto means cell so the characters of the cell they were also taken into consideration then the type of reproduction that the organism performs that was also taken okay so when all of these things were taken and they actually published their natural system of classification so the book that they published in was genera plantarum this is the name of the book okay okay so this was natural system of classification any doubts no ma now after that came the phylogenetic system of classification phylogenetic system of classification is even more advanced as compared to natural ones now this was proposed by engler and prantl again two people from the year 1887 to 1909 now what happens is that the phylogenetic system of classification here the word phylogenetic refers to the evolutionary history like whenever we talk about any organism we often say that right like the ancestors we talk about that like it belongs to this ancestor yes, it to that ancestor so when that ancestral history the evolutionary history is taken into consideration along with all of these things morphology anatomy cytological and reproduction then that type of system of classification is phylogenetic system of classification wherein the word phylogeny means ancestral history clear yes ma'am hmm. now this was all about the various systems of classification that people gave okay now after that what happened is that people started to make hierarchy system okay they said okay we'll put things into hierarchical form but for that see uh, since i have begin like begun with the chapter 2 but uh, in today's fresh class like after this class is done in the next class meaning when you will join the batch 
I'll start with chapter one because you know chapter one has a lot of technicality that I initially thought was not useful, but no, it is useful. Okay, so we'll do that also. Okay. okay. So, do you have any doubts up till now? No, ma'am. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And since you are new, I would like to tell you one more thing that you know in the class whenever I'm teaching, if anything poses a doubt in your mind, anything, even if it is like a littlest thing, you can ask me. Okay. Okay. Anything that comes to your mind, even if it is like you feel like it is stupid, you you can still ask me. Okay. 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 Now you can note these things down, and uh, then we'll start with a fresh chapter. Okay. Okay. Also, when you're done, you tell me. I'll scroll this. Thing. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am? Yes? Please, you can scroll, scroll down to me.
Mom? John? Yes, Mom. Can you go? No, Mom. Can you hear? Mom, I can't hear you. Your voice is very low. Hello, is it fine now? Yes, Mom. Hmm, I was asking, everything is clear? Yes, Mom. Do you have any doubt? No, Mom. Okay, very good. All right. Um, so uh, this is for the biological classification. Now, moving forward, see. Initially, if we will have to put it, like um, things into perspective or into groups. So these are the following groups, actually. But again, just to make you understand this, I have to teach you the living world chapter. Okay, so that is why I just asked you and I taught you up till here. Okay. okay. Now it's like the time is almost there only. Now the students will uh, start joining and we'll start the first chapter. Okay. So let's just wait for others to join and then we'll start. Okay. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, you stay here in the class only. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs>
Hello students, am I audible? Hello, am I audible students? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, I'm just waiting for everyone to join the class. Okay, and then I'll start, okay? Okay, ma'am. Am I audible, students? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes. Good evening, everyone. How are you all? 
good ma'am good everyone's good everyone's doing good all right okay now everyone switch on your cameras come on quick quick let's start the class today very good ma'am hmm. the homeworks they are not uploaded on the learning view app or the website you did not get the homework okay okay i'll, I'll see to that okay uh, so in the pre yeah in the previous class we did biological classification isn't it we started that particular chapter right hmm. yes, but uh, you know i was thinking that before moving further with that chapter i'll quickly like you know give you a brief that there is to come this is the first chapter of your book that is the living world okay so we are going to see what what all things are there see this chapter is pretty insignificant apart from a little bit of technicalities that are there in this chapter so we're going to see line by line as to what the book says okay and after that i'll give you certain well, you can say notes of this chapter okay to write and then we'll continue the biological classification okay also jaslyn is it is it your first class with me no ma'am for class 11 ma'am we had a div for yesterday i think all right so um we're going to start with the living world all right now see <clears throat> initially see uh, for now that there are so many parts that have been deleted from this chapter uh, earlier there used to be a whole entire topic about how we can find out whether an organism is living or dead how can you find out like how would you see something and think that okay that thing is living or is it dead movement movement right that thing if it is dead it would not be breathing isn't it a dead thing does not breathe does your table breathe no right and the table and not not just the table but any non living thing is unconscious right it does not have any consciousness so all of these things can actually help us to differentiate between a living thing from a non living thing now See in today's class, you do not need to take down any notes or anything because you know this is a PDF of the book only. After the class is done, I will send this PDF to each and every one of you. Okay, so you can read it, and then in the next class when we'll have, I'll give you the proper notes. Okay. All right. Now, see, ah, uh, the sum total of every single thing that is there in the world. whether it is the plants whether it is the animals the microorganisms the sum total of all of that that we see and you know we experience it is the biodiversity of the world it is the biodiversity like there are multiple number of plants that are maybe found in one region may not be found in any other region right and same goes for animals also for example like since i live in india so here we do not have polar bears isn't it because there is no snowy climate as such as antarctica right but the antarctica would have the polar bears but it would not have the camel isn't it so depending upon the geography depending upon the place the organism live but still if we count it as a whole so that becomes the biodiversity clear now you remember when i was teaching you in biological classification I told you that there is a big branch of science that is known as taxonomy. Everyone remembers this. Yes. Now this. Hmm. Now this taxonomy under this comes what all things? Tell me. Classification. Hmm. And. Identification. And. Nomenclature. Nomenclature. Classification, identification, and nomenclature. Now. let us see how the thing is and how we actually define it so uh, is my screen visible to everyone the words and everything are clear all right now there is a need to standardize the name of living organism okay yes one more thing okay how uh, what is the vernacular language that you people speak i speak hindi and urdu what about you people you tell me uh, sabiha you tell hindi and urdu ma'am 
Okay, Zana, what about you? Tamil. Tamil. Okay. Uh, and then Jesslyn, what about you? Telugu. Telugu. Okay. And Hafsa, what about you? Hafsa, are you there in the class? Hello, am I audible? Students, am I audible to you? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, Hafsa, are you there? Okay, anyway, the point, the, the reason why I am asking you why this the language thing is because, for example, if I take the example of a mango. Okay, now in Urdu, the mango, in Urdu and Hindi, the mango is known as Aam, isn't it? Now, in uh, tell me, uh, in Tamil, what is it known as? The mango is known as? Manga. What? Manga? Yeah, ma'am. Okay, manga. Okay, and in Telugu, what is it known as? Tell me, who speaks Telugu? Jesslyn? Mango is known as what? In your language? That's for Mavidi. Hmm? Mavidi. I can't hear you, dear. Mavidi. Okay. All right. I can't pronounce it. But see, you're seeing that one fruit has so many names in different languages, isn't it? Now, if Zanab were to say that, ma'am, I'm eating mango in her language, would I ever understand what she's saying? I'll not understand, isn't it? Or anyone, any other language also. So, yes. So, that there comes the reason why we need to name organisms in the field of biology. Now, if all of us stand together and say that, we are eating Mangifera indica. Okay, now this word that you said will be known by the entire globe. Every single person who is, you know, related to the field of biology, not just layman, but they will know that you're talking about mango. Why? Because Mangifera indica. This is the scientific name or the biological name of mango. Okay. Now, this is the worldwide accepted name. Okay, so this is the reason why we need to name anything. Okay, so to remove the confusion because everyone has their own native languages. So to remove that confusion, what do we do? We give a scientific name to anything. Okay, every single organism has a scientific name. As humans, we also have a scientific name. What is our scientific name? Does anyone know? What are we called? We have a name. You should know what you people are called. Humans. That is common. Now, that is English. For, like humans is in English, right? Insan in Hindi and Urdu. Then for Tamil, Telugu, there will be so many different words. But what is the yeah. scientific name? Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens. Now, if you go anywhere and say that I am a homo sapien, everyone would understand what you're saying. So you get what I'm trying to say that the scientific name is there so that every place would know that particular organism with that name. Same goes for all the variety of plants. Same goes for all the animals, humans, mm, even microorganisms. Okay, every single one. Now, <clears throat> So, this is why we do naming. So, as to remove the confusion, to make the name worldwide so that everyone knows any organism with that particular name. So, the standardized, the naming of living organisms such that a particular organism is known by the same name all over the world. This process is known as nomenclature. Now, when can you name anything? You'll name anything when you'll identify that thing. So, that identification comes into mind when the organism is described correctly and we know to what organism the name is attached to. This is the identification. Clear? Now we put it into groups and we classify them. But now coming on to the name part. See, the naming thing is also a very complicated process. Now what happens? There is actually a set of rules that we must follow when we are writing the name like scientific name 
and whenever like for example when in english also we write our name it, isn't it a rule to write the names of proper nouns with a capital letter isn't it and the common nouns can start with a small letter so our names and surnames both of them start with a capital letter right so that is the rule that we follow normally same happens in the field of science as well so for the plants okay now for plants scientific names are based on agreed principles and criteria which are provided in the international code for botanical nomenclature now everyone knows that the study of plants is botany right yeah. so this is the yes so this is that particular organization or the proper you can say the principles the rules and regulations which carry the naming for plants that is under the icbn the full form must always be remembered international code for botanical nomenclature then for animals also because we know that the study of animals is zoology so the iczn that is international code for zoological nomenclature iczn okay so they have set a certain you can say rules and regulations which have to be followed now biologists follow universally accepted principle to provide scientific names to known organisms each name has two components such as how our name also has two components one is the primary name one is the surname isn't it so same way in the field of biology also the name has two components the first is the generic name and then there is the specific epithet so this system since two naming system is there so this system of naming is known as binomial nomenclature so we follow binomial nomenclature by means two nomial is referring to the name so two name nomenclature is known as binomial nomenclature and this system of naming it was given by the scientist whose name is carolus linnaeus very important person in the field of biology carolus linnaeus and we call carolus linnaeus as the father of taxonomy the taxonomy that we study the rules and the groundwork has actually been done by carolus linnaeus always remember that he is known as the father of taxonomy and the rules for naming that he laid out it is actually being practiced by every single biologist any person that is in the field of biology he uses or follows these rules now this naming system using a two word format was found convenient now let us take the example of mango to understand the way of providing scientific names better now the scientific name of mango is mangifera indica now two names are there mangifera and indica now the first name that is the mangifera it is the name of the genus okay genus so the generic name you can say genus or you can say the generic name the first name is the generic name second part that is the indica that is the specific epithet it is a species okay so in this name mangifera represents the genus while indica is a particular species or a specific epithet so again since two components of the name are there so it is a binomial nomenclature now see these are the rules that are followed everywhere all over the world firstly see all the names that are actually there the biological names or the scientific name they are often derived from latin language okay they are latinized so mangifera even like no one has ever heard about mangifera in english right we know mango but mangifera is no word in english so this word is actually derived from the latin it is latinized okay so this is the first rule after that the second rule says that the first word in a biological name represents the genus while the second component denotes the specific epithet there is no exception it is the said rule now the third rule is that both the words in a biological name when handwritten 
are separately underlined. For example, if I write Mangifera indica. Mangifera indica. If I'm writing it with my hand in my notebook or copy or wherever, I'll underline it like this. Okay. This is what we have to do when we write it, like when we handwrite. But when you're typing it somewhere, for example, you're making, you know, making a PDF out of it or you're typing it anywhere from a computer, phone, anywhere. Have you people while typing seen that particular column that says bold italics underline? Have you seen that? The part of the keyboard that says I for italics. Have you seen that? Yeah. Right? So see, whenever we are printing it, whenever we are typing it out, we have to write it in italics. So sort of italics looks slant, isn't it? It's a slant handwriting that the computer generates. So then when you're writing it in italics, then you don't have to underline it. You have to underline it only when you're handwriting. Okay? So this is the third. Now after that, the first word denoting the genus starts with a capital letter while the specific epithet would start with a small letter. Okay. Just one second. Yes, so the, the name of the genus will always start with a capital letter and the species part, the specific epithet would start with a small letter. Again, no exception to this, okay? Now, for example, if I write the scientific name of rose, that is like Indian rose. So it is Rosa Indica. Indica is actually, if you see the word, it is denoting to the Indian native. Like it is from India. Now, when I'm writing it with hand, so I've started the genus name with capital R and the species name with small i, and then I separately underline. You'll not underline it like this. Okay. You'll not underline it like that. Clear? Any doubts up till now? I just didn't understand that latex keyboard thing. Oh, wait, wait. I'll, I'll make you understand. Just one second. See, uh, you people have laptops? Yes, ma'am. So have you ever typed in it? Document and the word, the word. So when, when you look at the top column, there are so many things like where you have to choose the font and everything. Now, under that, you will see that there is a letter I. That is actually the word that says italics. What it does, it makes the word slant. So whenever we are printing the scientific name, we use that only, okay, because we do not have to underline it when you're uh, like typing it or printing it out. But when you're writing it with your hand, then you have to underline it separately and you can't underline it like this. No, you have to write two words separately. You'll start the genus with the capital R, like sorry, the capital letter, the species with the small letter and you have to underline it separately. Clear? Yeah, thank you. This italics thing you've understood? Right, like after the class is done, you can check it in your uh, this thing also. When you'll you know when you'll click it, uh, click on it, you'll see all the words would go like this. It will be slant. Okay, that is italics. Clear? Yeah? Now, sometimes there are people who actually you know, for example, if you went on a hike or anywhere and you actually discovered a new plant, okay, and you want to name it. Now you would want that your name should be printed along with it since you are the one who found it. Isn't it? We would want that credit to be done. So that is also possible. See, the name of the author appears after the specific epithet. If there is any author that wants to publish, uh, publish his or her name along with the scientific name. So what is done? At the end of the biological name and it is written in an abbreviated form. You people understand what is the meaning of abbreviation? Yes. The short form, isn't it? Hmm. So, for example, if Mangifera Indica was actually, this name was given by Linnaeus. So, Mangifera, again, just the way how it is written. And Linnaeus is written as L-I-N-N -N dot. Okay? So, this is like the author's name have to be written after the specific epithet. 
and it has to be abbreviated. Clear? Yeah? All right. <clears throat> so now, since it is nearly impossible to study all the living organism, it is necessary to devise some means to make this possible. This process is known as classification. Classification, we put it, like put things into groups. Now, basically, initially on the observable characters. For example, we easily recognize groups such as plants or animals or dogs, cats or insects. All of these are so different, right? So we can easily put them into certain groups. Now, when we put them into groups, like for example, um, let's just say there is class 11. Now, in all of your schools, sections might be divided, isn't it? Section A, section B, section C might be there. So, a large batch of children is actually put into certain groups so that it will be easier for the teacher to take attendance or it would be easier for distribution and everything. Same thing is done here also. But here, the scientific category is given. Okay, whether anything is an insect, whether it is a ta dog, cat, or a mammal, we have to put them into a certain category. And what is that category known as? It is known as the taxa. Okay, so this taxa can be at different level, like plants also form a taxa. Wheat, which comes under the plant only, that also forms a taxa. Taxa means category. Okay. Same way, there, there can be multiple taxa at different levels. Now, this no. study of taxa that we have done and all the nomenclature identification that comes under taxonomy. And who is the father of taxonomy? Carlos. Uh, Carlos. Linnaeus. Linnaeus. Yes, Carolus Linnaeus. That is the father of taxonomy. Now, the external and internal structure along with the structure of cell, development process, ecological information of organisms, all of these are very important to understand and to actually classify organisms. Zanab, the meaning of taxa is a category, any category. Okay, for example, if, if the category is egg-laying mammals, or sorry, if the category is those organisms that give birth to young ones. So then mammals, right? Mammals are the ones that give you birth to young ones. And then this mammals is a tax. Meaning it is one kind of category. Clear? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Also, Hafza, are you there in the class now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So all of these things that we did study, all of these uh, characterization, identification, this would come under taxonomy. Now, taxonomy is not something new. Human beings have always been interested in knowing more and more about the various kinds of organisms, particularly with reference to their own use. In early days, human beings needed to find sources for their bas basic need of food, clothing and shelter. Hence, the earliest classification was based on the uses of various organisms because earlier people did not have enough knowledge about things, right? But slowly, slowly when education came and everything came, then we evolved the way that we studied things. Now, we just now are not just interested in what will be useful to us. We want to know in general how many organisms are there, what is their mechanism, how their body is like, everything we want to know. So when we talk about the different kinds of organisms and their diversity. Like diversity means how vast their population is. What are the different kinds? So this comes under the study that is known as systematics. Okay, means the systematic arrangement of organisms. Again, the word systematics has been derived from the Latin word. That means that the Latin word is systema, which means that systematic arrangement of organisms. So Linnaeus was the first person who actually studied and systematically arranged organisms, tried to actually, and then he published it. Okay, and his publication was titled as Systema Naturae. Just like how, if you must remember from uh, the natural system of classification, do you remember the name of the book? Bentham and Hooker. 
they published their work in a book. What was the name of the book? Genera Plantarum. Correct. Genera Plantarum. So that was the name of a book, right? So same way when, see, whenever in the field of science, whenever you found, like find something or, you know, uh, do any research work, you publish it. Publishing, right? How books are published. Same way, Linnaeus also published and his publication was named as Systema Naturae. Okay? Now, the scope of systematics was later enlarged to include identification, nomenclature, classification, and along with that, evolutionary relationship between organisms means the ancestral history. Clear? Now, here in this chapter, you might find that everything is very repetitive because you have already studied this, isn't it? I have taught you this in the previous class only in biological classification. Now, now we will talk so, uh, about something that is very interesting also, that is taxonomic categories. Now, classification is not a single step process, but involves hierarchy of steps in which each step represents a rank or a category. Since the category is a part of overall taxonomic arrangement, it is known as taxonomic category. And all categories together, it forms the taxonomic hierarchy. Hierarchy, you people understand how the king is there, then the throne goes to the prince. Isn't it? That is hierarchy. That is how it happens. Same way, in the taxonomic hierarchy, organisms are arranged in such a way. For example, Insects represent a group of organisms sharing common features like three pairs of jointed legs. It means insects are recognizable concrete objects which can be classified and thus were given a rank or a category. Meaning, if you look or compare an insect with a dog, you can easily distinguish them like insects have three pairs of legs, meaning they have six legs, but the dogs have two pairs. Isn't it? Two forelimbs, two hind limbs. So you can actually distinguish them. So dog will be kept at a different category. Insects will be kept at a dis different category. Right? So this category is the taxa that we referring. Okay? The taxa that we earlier discussed. This is what the taxa is. Clear? Any doubts up till now? No, ma'am. Okay. Now talking about this category. So, if I say hierarchy, everyone understands the meaning of hierarchy? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. So, hierarchy starts from the highest to the lowest, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Now, okay, very good. Now, talking about the taxonomical hierarchy, so it starts with the highest form of hierarchy, that is kingdom. After kingdom comes phylum for animals, and division for plants. Then, class. After this, order. After this, family. Then, genus. And lastly, there is the species. Now, see, when we name organisms, we just take the lower two categories. Isn't it? We do not refer to the kingdom or anything. Now, always remember that the kingdom is the highest category or the highest taxa and the species is the lowest taxa. Okay, so, and this is what the sequence will be like forever. The sequence will not change. It will start with kingdom. After kingdom will come phylum. After phylum, class. After class, order. Then family, genus and species. Now, if anyone has a difficulty in remembering this, I'll give you a mnemonic. I gave it in the previous class also. Do you people remember the mnemonic? Yes, please. Okay. So, the mnemonic goes like, keep pots clean or family gets sick. This is how you will remember it. So that you know that the first letter stands for the hierarchy. A for kingdom, P for phylum for animals, division for plants. Then C for class, O for order, then family is family, 
G is for genus and S is for species. Okay, so this is your taxonomical hierarchy and this is how the sequence will be like, right? So we have kingdom, phylum, division, or uh, class, order, family, genus, species. All organisms, including those in the plant and animal kingdoms, have the species as the lowest category. Right? Now, we'll start with the lowest category. Okay. Now, see, tell me one thing. Okay. The, okay, I'm asking you just to see if you people understand what I have taught. If I talk about the organisms in a kingdom... And if I talk about the organisms in the species, okay, two different taxa or two different categories I'm talking about. The organisms in the kingdom and the organisms in the species. Now tell me, out of those, which one will be more similar to each other? The members of kingdom, the members of species. Like which one will be very closely situated or... Kingdom, ma'am. Kingdom. kingdom. Mm -hmm. Species. 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 Not the kingdom. See, kingdom will be very high since it is the highest category. Okay. So, the organisms here are you know, roughly divided into groups. They will not be closely related. But if you talk about species, then they will be closely related. Okay. Everyone gets this thing? Hmm? Yes. Sir. Any doubts? Yes, All right. Now, talking about species. Now, we'll discuss species in depth. Now, taxonomic studies consider a group of individuals or group of individual organisms with fundamental similarities as a species. Okay, species, see, uh, species is a group of organisms that are very closely related to each other. Okay, so all the organisms will be very similar to each other and one should be able to distinguish one species from the other closely related species based on the morphological differences. Now see this thing. Let us consider Mangifera indica. This is your mango. Solanum tuberosum. This is the scientific name of potato. Okay. Then Panthera leo. This is the scientific name of lion. Now, all the three names, that is like the species name, Indica, Tuberosum, and Leo, represent the specific epithet. While the first word, that is Mangifera, Solanum, and Panthera, these are the genus names. Right? So, if now, amongst them, do you see any similarity? Indica, Tuberosum, Leo, like one is a fruit, one is a vegetable. Do you see any similarities? No, mm -hmm. But if I say mm, that there is, okay. Solanum tuberosum. Solanum melongina. Now see, Solanum tuberosum is the scientific name of potato. Right? And Solanum tuberosum, oh sorry, tuberosum is the scientific name of potato. Melongena is the scientific name of brinjal. Now, if I say that amongst Solanum tuberosum and Solanum melongena, do you see any similarity? Yes, sir. What yes, is the similarity? Vegetables. No. Look at the names. What is the similarity? Yes, so they are vegetables. Food, That's food, right. Generic names. Hmm? The first word. Solanum. Yeah, what is the first word? Solanum. No, but Solanum is what? The generic names are the same. Generic name, the genus. So you can say that the potato and the brinjal, they belong to one common genus. They belong to one genus. The species are different. But the genus is same. You people are getting this? Yes, ma'am. Is it clear to everyone? That, uh, like the similarity and difference between them? Clear to every single one here? Yes, Say yes or no? Hmm. What about the others? Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. So, we can say that each genus 
may have one or more than one specific epithet. Isn't it? The example is right here in front of you. Now, there are many examples of this, such as panthera. It has another specific epithet called as tigris. This is for tiger. Leo is for lion. Tigris is for tiger. So, ma'am, genera and genetic are same. No. Genera and genus is same. Genetics is something else. Genetics is different. No. Uh, solanum includes species like nigrum, melongena. Now, human beings belong to the species that is sapiens, which is grouped into the genus that is homo. So, we are homo sapiens. Now, everyone has understood species? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Now, species, is it the lowest category or the highest category? Lowest category. Lowest category. Now, the similarities amongst the species will be highest or lowest? Highest. Highest. Okay. Now, another question. If I say um, amongst all of these taxonomical hierarchy, okay, now you people have right now told me that Species will have the maximum amount of similarity, right? Now, my next question is that amongst all of these taxonomical hierarchy, which one will have the largest number of organisms present in? A huge number of organisms will be present in which category? Kinder. Hmm? Kinder. Who said that? Zainab, you said? You're right. Kingdom. Kingdom will have the highest number of organisms, but the lowest number of similarity. Is there any similarity between plant and animal? No. no. So, kingdom plant, it, it is one kingdom. Kingdom animal, it is another kingdom. So, largest number of organisms, but the lowest number of similarity. Same goes for species. Lowest number of organism, but largest number of of, of similarity. Similarities. Hmm. So you people write down one thing that is very important that you write down. The number of organisms. The number of organisms present from the highest taxonomical cat category. Or you write down from the highest taxonomical hierarchy. Ma'am, could you repeat? Yes. The, the last, what did I say? What, what was I saying? Tell me. The number of organisms. Huh. The number of organisms from the highest taxonomic category. The number of organisms from the highest taxonomic category category decreases to the lowest taxonomic category. The number of organism would decrease. Okay? This is a rule. I mean, this is what it is. Okay? So, the from the highest to the lowest, the number of organism will decrease. Yeah? Um, uh, can we continue this in the notes of the first chapter we wrote? This thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can continue. Yes, 100%. And uh, uh, then you write uh, this thing you've written. Okay. Yes. Then you write down the number of similarities, the number of similarities from the highest taxonomic category, from the highest taxonomic category to the lowest taxonomic category decreases. No, increases. It increases. From high to low, the number of similarity will increase. But the number of organism will decrease. Ma'am, the number of organism will increase or decrease? The number of organisms starting from highest to lowest will decrease. The number of similarities will increase. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 
Any doubt up till now? All right, now moving on to the next higher, higher than species, genus. Now genus comprises a group of related species which has more characters in common as compared to the species of the other genera. Like for example, the species belonging to one genus will have more common characters as compared to the different genus, right, genera. Now for example, potato and brinjal are two different species but both belong to the same genus that is Solanum. Lion that is Panthera leo, leopard that is Panthera pardus, tiger that is Panthera tigris. All of them have common features that they have the common genus that is Panthera. Even though all of them are very different species. If you look at a lion, if you look at a tiger, you can clearly see that they are very different, isn't it? But uh, apart from being different, but they have one common thing that all of them are carnivores, isn't it? They hunt and they belong to the genus Panthera. This genus differs from another genus that is Felis, which includes cats. Now, the cats come under the Felis or Felis. So again, cats and lions are very different from each other, isn't it? But they again form, you'll see how they are connected to each other. See, the next category is family. So when all of the genus are put together, it forms a family. So a group of genus is family. Just like how a group of species was genus, now a group of genus becomes a family. Now, family has a group of related genera or genus with still less number of similarities as compared to the genus and species. Families are characterized on the like on the vegetative and reproductive features of the plant species. Among plants, for example, three different genera, that is Solanum, that is for potato family, right? Petunia and Datura. All of three, all of these three have different genera, but they belong to one family, that is family Solanaceae. Clear? So again, you see that one family, that is Solanaceae is there. Okay, now this Solanaceae has actually been divided into three genus or genera in which you have Solanum genera, you have Petunia genera and you have Datura genera, right? And under the Solanum, there will be multiple species, isn't it? So you're seeing that so Solanum, which is a different genus, this, which is a different genus, all of them are different genera, but they belong to one family that is Solanaceae, clear? This is clear to everyone? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Now see, among animals, the genus Panthera, it comprises lion, tiger, leopard, is put along with the genus that is Felis for cats in the family that is Felidae. Now for animals, the family is Felidae. Now under this comes actually two genuses. First is the Panthera genus. And then there is what the felis genus. So under the felis comes all the cats, and under the panthera comes lion, tiger, and leopard. So all of them, even after being different species, they belong to one common family that is felidae. So you understand the concept how um, the felidae, like the cats and the tigers and everything, they are still related to each other, but a little less with little less similarities. Clear? Ma'am, could you oh. explain the cat part again? Which part? The cat fell again. See, uh, just like how Solanaceae was the family, under the Solanaceae came the genus that is Solanum, then the genus that is Punia, the genus that is Datura. All of them have one common feature that they belong to the family Solanaceae. Even though they are very different from each other, potato and the petunia flower, they are so different from each other, isn't it? But they belong to one family. They come under one family. Same goes for animals also. For example, we have studied about the genus that is Panthera. And the genus of the cats is Felis. So both of them have one common thing that they belong to the family that is Feli. Okay? Yes. This is what I was saying. And then furthermore, they will be having multiple types of species like Panthera tigris, 
panthera leo the different species are there for cats also there will be different species clear yes ma'am now coming on to the next that is order now uh, a group of families will form the order right so order being a higher category is the assemblage of families which exhibit a few similar characters the similar characters are less in number as compared to that of a genera included in a family again as we are slowly slowly rising up towards the higher category the number of similarity will obviously decrease isn't it on going up now plant families such as convolvulaceae solanaceae are included in the order polymoniales now the higher the order is polymoniales under this comes different families there will come solanaceae convolvulaceae okay so all of these are like we are showing that how now families are coming together and forming one taxonomical category that is the order same goes for animal the animal order is known as carnivora now this carnivora will include the family such as felidae and canidae now felidae is known as the cat family and canidae is known as the dog family now further if felidae we go further so we'll have panthera and felis and then under canidae there will be dog like organisms clear this thing yes, is clear order is clear hmm. now we have the next category that is class now a group of orders will make the class for example the order primata which has monkey gorilla gibbon is placed in the class mammalia now this is our class also we also belong to this class okay and the other carnivores such as the tiger cats and dog they also belong to mammalia okay so all of us have one common thing amongst us is that we belong to the class mammalia clear hmm yes ma'am yes ma'am then there is phylum now classes a group of classes will become a phylum this is the next higher category classes comprising animals like fishes amphibians reptiles birds along with mammals all of us would come under one phylum okay now all these based on common features like the presence of notochord dorsal hollow neural system these are included in the phylum for data the ones that have notochord present you will understand notochord when we'll come to animal kingdom for now you must understand this thing that they all belong to one phylum again phylum is the higher class now comes the highest category that is the kingdom now here the number of organism will be highest the number of similarity will be the lowest then there is kingdom plantae for plants there is kingdom animalia for animals this much is clear to everyone yes ma'am now since all of these kingdoms are there so one will be the kingdom for animal one will be the plant kingdom now the taxonomic categories from species to kingdom have been shown in ascending order we you already have seen this and these are broad categories however there are sub sub categories also like sub phylum sub sub phylum but we do not have to study that we just have to study this thing so now the the same thing is written over here that as we go higher from species to kingdom the number of common characters goes on decreasing meaning the similarities would decrease the number of organisms would increase now see this chart this chart is the scientific name chart with their taxonomic categories for example we're talking about man so the biological name of man is homo sapiens wherein the genus is homo the family is hominidae the order is primata the class is mammalia and the phylum or division is chordata for house fly the scientific name is musca domestica domestica referring to that it is found in our domestic household right so that is where domestica now the musca here is the genus muscidae is the family order is diptera class is insecta since house flies an insect and then phylum is orthopoda then there is mango mangifera indica the genus is mangifera 
family of mango is anacardiaceae then there is sapindale is my like voice fine yes ma'am yes the order is sapindales the class is dicotyledony and then the phylum is angiospermy for wheat triticum estivum is the scientific or the biological name triticum is the genus the family is poaceae the order is poales the class is monocotyledony and then the phylum or the division is angiospermy now talking about the kingdom they have not mentioned the kingdom so tell me what kingdom would man belong to kingdom animalia or kingdom plantae animalia very good what about house fly animalia animalia what about mango plantae plantae and what about wheat plantae correct now see uh, this chapter is over Okay, this is the first, the introductory chapter and this has been over. Now, tell me, do you people have any doubts? Um, no, ma'am, just um, the, the kingdom thing, it was um, derived by Carlos uh, de Mena. Mm -hmm. The kingdom thing, I did not understand your question. No, because in the first chapter, we wrote the two kingdom classification. It was like proposed by Carlos de Mayes. Hmm. Correct. So the whole taxonomy it, it, uh, proposed by him or just the kingdom thing? No, actually, see, since the whole taxonomy is not proposed by him, the two kingdom classification that I taught to you, that was given by Carolus Linnaeus only. And because he was the one who actually started to do this, that is why he is known as the father of taxonomy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. apart from that, he also discovered the systematics that we have studied in this chapter. Okay, now see, this chapter is done. After this class ends, I'll provide you with the PDF. Okay, now everyone, you read the PDF, every single thing that is written there. Okay, now you mark the point wherever you have doubts. Now in the next class, I will clear all of your doubts if you do have while reading. Okay. And I will also provide you with the homework and I'll see about your homework also. And uh, apart from that, yeah, see, the scientific names are important to remember, okay? The scientific name of all the organisms, like apart from these four, you also have the scientific name of lion, tiger, leopard, right? Leopard is there. And I also taught you the scientific name of rose, isn't it? Mm. What else? Uh, mango. Hmm? mango is already there. Right? Mango is here. Wheat is here. Housefly is here. Man is here. So all of the scientific names which have been mentioned Dog. in this book. Hmm? Dog. What dear? In this dogs. I can't hear you. He's saying dogs, ma'am. Dogs. Oh, dogs. Dogs. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah. So, all of the scientific names, you you make a list. Okay, you make a list of the scientific names and you learn those scientific names because it will be helpful forever. Okay, and since this chapter is over, now in the next class, what we will do, I'll give you proper notes so that you can, you know, learn. And that is it. Then we'll continue biological classification. Clear? Mom, what is the scientific name for danger? Brinjal, Solanum melongena. Yes, brinjal is there. Um, then potato is there. Then petunia, datura. So all of these names, you'll I'll give you the PDF. So you make a list in your notebooks. Okay, so that you'll know all of these things, right? So you should know the scientific names and everything. Now, this chapter is clear to every single one here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma everyone? Okay. Do you people have any doubts? Anything that, that you did not understand in this chapter? No, ma'am. All right. Very good. Very happy to hear that. Now, see, I'll send you this PDF. You people read it nicely.